All nonprofit organizations are different, just like every business is different. Two coffee shops or two computer stores may look alike, but they have their differences. Just like two animal rescue organizations or two food banks may be similar, they each have their own way of doing things, a preferred procedure. But no matter what a nonprofit organization calls itself or what its mission is, they all have certain similarities, like all the financial record keeping and reporting they have to do. Accountant Chris Carmona is keeping tabs on the San Antonio nonprofit community, and we're going to check on the bottom line. Welcome to BearCast. <music> I'm Randy Lankford, and this is BearCast, a weekly interview with business, political, education, and nonprofit leaders. We're examining the relationships between all four and how each one benefits from the success of the other three. Chris Carmona is a founding partner at Shriver, Carmona & Company in San Antonio, where he leads the assurance and advisory operations. Chris is the driving force in the company's commitment to the San Antonio nonprofit community. He volunteers his professional services and personal efforts, serving on the board of Eva's Heroes and the regional board of KIPP Texas. In addition to board positions, Chris is a business advisory committee member of the San Antonio Nonprofit Council. He's also volunteered his time to El Fluiz, the San Antonio Food Bank, Habitat for Humanity, SAM Ministries, the Adelante Fund Leadership Institute, and Healthy Futures of Texas. Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Well, it's great to have you. You're just the guy I need to talk to. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about nonprofit bookkeeping and, and accounting. And being a nonprofit doesn't mean you can't have money left over at the end of the year. Is there a simple explanation of the accounting differences between a for-profit business and a nonprofit organization? And before you answer that, bear in mind, I'm a guy that can't balance my own checkbook. So keep it simple. <laughs> Well, I didn't, I didn't even know you, you can still balance checkbooks. I'm, right. I'm just kidding. But uh, um, there's QuickBooks and it does it for you now, right? But, right. Um, you know, as far as differences in, in accounting, um, you you want to – I used to always believe in in that nonprofit scene is to think like for-profit businesses. And as I really started to ingrain myself in the nonprofit community and their finances and, and serving on nonprofit boards and finance committees – but I come to realize it's not so much that nonprofits need to be like for profits. It's really applying or nonprofits looking at applying for profit business principles into into how they manage their finances. Um, and so it's a, it's a little bit different versus thinking like a for profit. So applying for profit principles, you have to you know consider who your stakeholders are. Sure. Uh, you also have to. Uh, understand cash management. When is when is the right time to to pay your bills? Uh, you know, in, in terms of cash outflow, uh, diversify your revenue streams. Uh, so those sort of principles are are just as important in the nonprofit world. So that's what I would say on on, on those sort of on that question. So. All right. Um, there, it, I've I found that there are a lot of little bitty nonprofit organizations in San Antonio, one and two person operations. But there are accounting rules that every nonprofit has to abide by, no matter what size or budget or, or anything like that. There's a certain amount of accounting that goes into even becoming a nonprofit. To even get a 501c3, you have to do a certain amount of accounting. Being tax exempt doesn't mean you don't file a return. There are rules about reporting how grants are used and reports for the board of directors. And where do you see all those little bitty nonprofits like mine? Uh, struggling with accounting? What's what's their biggest challenge and what can they do about it? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Randy. I think that, you know, there sometimes becomes a balance with, um, you know, when you start a, a nonprofit, uh, there's a mission in mind, right? And there's, right. there's, there's either it's been a need assessment or there's some program. And so the programming side of things always become the forefront of, of a beginning nonprofit. And then the accounting aspect, um, even things such as HR, uh, risk management, those sort of things uh, start to come into play as the organization grows, as you build your boards out. Um, and so I can definitely understand kind of those sort of, of uh, uh, functions within a nonprofit, which are you know, the same functions uh, that for-profit businesses have, 
Sure. Uh, but from a nonprofit perspective, um, you know, it's all about the mission. And, and not having these functions in place uh, could, could harm um, the ability or, or, or hinder the nonprofit's ability to scale. And, right. and so when you think about, well, it's a, it's a, it's cost, right? The, uh, accounting. And I, I was, I uh, had the opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to provide a workshop uh, for the McKenna foundation earlier this week. Oh. And, and we got on the subject of, of allocation, right? Allocation of expenses between programs, management in general and fundraising. And when you think of management in general and fundraising, those are, those are what are called overhead costs. Right. And, and I'm an accountant in any corporate, uh, uh, any corporation, uh, your accounting department is a cost center. We generate zero revenue. Right. And so I, I feel, <laughs> I feel for nonprofits or who, who have to struggle and try to explain, you know, this quote unquote overhead cost, but it's an important factor of, of running the organization. And so I think, uh, from a principal standpoint, it's really kind of understanding who would be the users of your financial information. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's always going to be, I think, a good base to start with, uh, uh, because that will determine the type of accounting that you may have to uh, incorporate. So whether you need to report for grants uh, early on, if you need to report on, on a generally accepted uh, principles, basis, general accepted accounting principles, which is known as GAP, right. um, or is cash basis okay, or is other uh, bases of accounting uh, okay, such as modified cash basis, right? So there's different modifications and different bases of accounting. So understanding who are the users of our financial information and, and, and in what format, what manner, what are they, how are they utilizing this financial information to make decisions about um, whether how they're going to uh, fund us or whether they are going to fund us, uh, but also internally when you have your board of directors and, and internally having to make decisions um, uh, you know, utilizing your financial data uh, to, to make those informed decisions. So being able to, to not only look at a accounting from a standpoint of what's already happened, but can you take that information and, and start to project out and forecast out? I think that's another important aspect that all nonprofits should be doing early on is saying, what is the cash in and outflow? What do we predict our cash inflow, our cash outflow to be so that you can do cash projections, cash flow projections, so you're thinking ahead as to when you might have gaps in funding. Um, and that will at least prepare you instead of being reactive uh, in 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 uh, certain situations. Oh, well, you know, we're not receiving that grant this month or right. we were... Um, we expected this grant to happen, but we got noticed that it's not going to happen. So we're able to kind of be agile and make those decisions from a, from a, a projection standpoint. So that's also, I think that that's extremely important for nonprofits to, to consider uh, in, on top of budgeting, you know, so that you can stay within guidelines and parameters and having a good budgeting process in place and, and bu- budgeting policy in place, uh, but not just thinking about the budget but thinking about how we're generating that revenue and when is it expected to come in. Right, right. You, you, you raise a couple of points there. Um, it sounds very similar just to a household accounting, household budgeting. You know, we're, we, we have these bills that we, we know we are going to have. How are we going to account for those? How are we going to, how are we going to pay those? The, the, the other point that is really very interesting to me is when you mention overhead. Because there, there was a time when uh, nonprofit organizations had to account for their overhead, and it had to be under a certain percentage of their of their annual budget. And I I seem to see that tide turning. That that the the funders, the grant makers, the the corporations that make donations are beginning to to take the same kind of a a, a viewpoint that you just expressed. That it takes you have to have overhead expenses in a nonprofit organization, just like you do in any business that you got to pay for the lights. You got to pay salaries. You got to pay the rent. Those that's not money that goes directly to the mission, but it's becoming more, I I feel like it's becoming more acceptable that, yeah, well, we understand you got to pay the bills. Do you see that? Absolutely. I think there's still, um, 
that that is definitely an, a, a, a kind of a a trend or a thought uh, process, or even in some for some funders, uh, really taking out that aspect of overhead versus uh, versus program mm -hmm. and and granting uh, for the first time granting uh, you know dollars for operations, right. uh, which was as you mentioned, you know just three, four, five years ago was that was unheard of. Right. Uh, you had to be very specific on where you're using the funding for which programs, because there's a big push towards, you know, the more dollars that goes towards programs, and that means you're going to have uh, better outcomes. Right. And that's not necessarily the truth. Uh, you have to look at the organization holistically and look at the different functions, whether you consider them overhead, but how, you know, how, is, how are the fundraising dollars coming in? How are you raising awareness about the programs you provide? And, exactly. and those would be considered marketing dollars, which could be considered, you know, overhead dollars in a sense, right? Uh, how are you accounting for the funding? How, uh, you know, what about compliance reporting if you're needed? All those functions are a huge um, factor into the delivery of the mission. Uh, and so that's extremely um, important for funders to really look at it that way. And not only funders, but even individuals as they give. And, and, and because there still are individuals who, you know, have access to 990s, uh, there's a lot of information available. So your donors and your, your, those who are, are contributing uh, have access to information. They're doing their research before they give money uh, to an organization. And I think you have to look at not only the efficiencies of the dollars, um, but also are they, what's, what is the overall outcome, right? And are those outcomes um able to to be repeated and multiplied and not so much worry about is the dollars going strictly to programs right, right. And, so look at look at the mission look at look at and because whether you're doing accounting for a nonprofit or whether you're uh you know out fundraising or whether you're directly impacting uh serving the client directly that's all for the mission of the organization right. Uh, a, a living wage uh, contributes to the success of the mission. If yes. we can't hire qualified people and pay them a competitive wage, then our mission is going to suffer. The, the the success of our mission is going to is going to be impacted. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and that's a great point as well. I think that when you take that equation out, um, you you are opening the opportunities for nonprofits to to hire uh, to be competitive with wages. And to bring on the the, the right folks to to help uh, um, you know scale the organization or elevate the organization to, to the next levels versus being worried about uh, well we have to stay at this level of salary because it's 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 going to a person of overhead you know a person who mainly their function is overhead mm -hmm. or it's allowing organizations to to really think about uh, how they are utilizing um, uh, those those dollars as it relates to quote unquote overhead uh, by saying, okay, well now we don't have to worry about that so much. So maybe now we have options. Maybe we, maybe we should outsource this function or maybe we should bring in, now we're at the point where we need to bring in a CFO. We need to bring yes. in a CMO. We need to really up the game on how the leadership is, is functioning holistically for the organizational uh, uh, for the benefit of the organizational health of the organization of the nonprofit. 100%. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Um, I know when, when we started Bearfest, I was keeping the books. And trust me, nobody wants that. <laughs> but it's just a matter of necessity. You don't have any money to pay someone to do it, but the books have to be maintained. Volunteering your services as an accountant is huge to small nonprofits on a tight budget like, like we are. And I'm not sure how many people know that's an option. You hear about people volunteering to provide labor or donate money to a nonprofit, but there's a whole world of nonprofits that need professional services like accounting and legal services. Is, is San Antonio unique? Are, are there a lot of professionals in San Antonio who, who do pro bono work for nonprofit organizations? Is, there, is, that a, is that a subculture of San Antonio? You know, I think the one thing we can say about San Antonio is that, that there's it's a giving community. Right. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I mean the, the the amount or the number of nonprofits here in San Antonio that are able to maintain uh, their 501c3 status, 
uh, uh, shows that that there's we're a giving community. Right. Um, there's evidence such as uh, we have the here in San Antonio, just as other major cities have their their giving days. Um, sure. So the the big give here in San Antonio, uh, you see that through 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 the uh, the number of dollars, the number of of donors who are giving uh, to these sort of of one day uh, giving days, and so. Uh, so there's definitely a generosity uh, that 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 kind of just is part of the fabric, you know, in, in the San Antonio culture. Um, but I think one one area that can be explored more is, is what you're mentioning here, which is providing professional service through through pro bono. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it's I I think the first place that people look or saying, okay, well, we're going to build our board around certain skills, right? And then and then have you know maybe a working board or resources that we can turn to. Um, but you can even take that even further. I'm not aware of any, let's say like central hub of, of professionals that, that nonprofits can turn to uh, when they need legal services uh, or when they need accounting services or when they maybe need web development services, things of those uh, that you sure. typically have to go out and, and pay for. Um, um, but I, I, I'm for sure within the different trade groups in San Antonio, the professional uh, the from the professional trades, such as the you know like the San Antonio Bar Association or the San Antonio CPA Society, I think there could be ways to tap in to those talents um, to 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 offer nonprofits uh, connections right. to these membership based organizations to not only to find board members uh, but to also find uh, folks that contribute their time towards projects. And you know, I recently read an article. Um, uh, there's a, a, I guess it's an organization or maybe a platform called Capacity Commons, and it's a one-stop shop for skills-based volunteerism. Oh. And, and it's a great resource, I think, because it kind of shows, it, it allows the nonprofit organization to kind of look and are we ready for for this, for pro bono volunteerism from a professional, uh, from a skills-based volunteer um, uh, uh, collaboration or, right. or, or skilled based volunteerism uh, in general. And so it, it, it actually preps and shows the nonprofit kind of, okay, how do you prepare yourself to, 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 to effectively uh, use skilled based uh, volunteerism. And that's important because uh, you know, you, you're pulling on, on, on professional skills that these these uh, professionals they they earn a wage doing every day and they want to help, right. but when it's when it's sporadic in terms of can you pull together our financials or can you let's say from an accounting perspective can you um, prepare a nine ninety uh, there there's there there's other ways to expand that volunteerism by being very thoughtful about how when and how you use those skills and if you look at things from a project base uh, that's a very good use of, of, of somebody's uh, professional skill because they know there's a beginning and ending time right, right? Um, but also be prepared that just because you're obtaining this professional to come help you that you they're still going to need to be they're still going to have to have um, staff support from the nonprofit uh, nonprofits uh, pool of, 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 of staff right. uh, to help uh, in this process so um, when I saw this, uh, and this was actually after you you had uh, uh, kind of posed this question to me, I was like, "This is perfect." I mean, this is something that that uh, could could be useful. So I started looking into, it, and I, I think it provides a lot of great um, resources for nonprofits to to assess and 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 to build a, a good uh, process for implementing uh, skills based volunteerism. And I think once once you have something that nonprofits are thoughtful about it, then you can you can get that platform out there or nonprofits can be a little bit more open, maybe on using social media right. uh, to, to gain access to these professionals. Uh, Cause sometimes, you know, there's a lot of professionals out there that are, that want to help. They just don't know how to help. Exactly. They don't know who needs the help. Right. Uh, and so it's, sometimes it's that simple ask. Um, but, but when you ask for that uh, help, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're utilizing their impact when they do help. So being prepared, knowing exactly from a project base with what you need them to do uh, and, 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 and set that expectation up front.
treat them respectfully. Um, yes. If you're, if you're going to ask somebody to help you, treat them respectfully and, and make it as easy as possible to help you. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You're, you're obviously deeply connected with the San Antonio uh, nonprofit community. We, we've talked about that. And I mentioned in the, in the intro about your involvement with Kip and uh, Eva's Heroes. Where did that come from? Where, where, tell me the backstory about how you got involved with the San Antonio nonprofit community and what drives you to do that. Um, you know, I, I, the, the willingness to want to be involved and to give really stems back from when I was a kid. Um, my grandparents raised me and I just remember as a kid, just them always being active in our church, being active, my grandfather being active with Lions Club, always volunteering his time and, and his expertise. And so I, that was just something that always was ingrained in my head uh, growing up. It just was kind of a part of our, our core values as a family, if you will. Um, part of the, the, the culture of our family, of, of, of giving back of our time and of our talents. And, and in a lot of cases, uh, in, in my grandparents' uh, situation, they were able to give of their, of their treasure as well. And so, um, you know, we fast forward to about 10 years ago uh, when I started this practice, uh, roughly about nine years ago. But a year before that, I was really itching to to, to see how I can utilize my skill set of being a CPA in the nonprofit world. And that's when that, that kind of itch uh, uh, came from remembering just what my grandparents did. And then I've had several family members uh, either in leadership positions uh, for nonprofit organizations here in San Antonio. So, uh, you know, again, it's just all, it's kind of been a part of, of my growing up. But knew that, you know, starting a business early on, being able to give of my treasures, which were very slim uh, <laughs> uh, at the time, you know, and, and at times you want to make sure that you're, you are not just giving of your treasures, but also giving of your time and of your talents. And I think that that was really something that stuck out to me and said, this is how I can help. And, and um, of course, you know, getting started, uh, you're a finance guy or you're a CPA. So, you know, automatically I'm, I was, uh, asked to be on the finance committee, me being a CPA, and that's an area that, that I'm comfortable with and know I can I can immediately make an impact. Um, but I challenge folks that who are involved in organizations to to once you get familiar with the mission and the values of the organization, uh, to to expand on those skill sets and 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 look at maybe serving on other committees that maybe you're not so comfortable in serving, such as fundraising uh, committees. Uh, or governance committees, because uh, that will help expand your skill set, and I think that provides uh, uh, additional value to any organization that, that you're a part of, because you you are expanding yourself to to learn other aspects of of nonprofits uh, operations, right. and, uh, and, and so I think that's important as well. And it's funny the the deeper you get into a nonprofit organization, the 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 more consuming it becomes that it just it it gets harder and harder to kind of distance yourself you do a little bit i want to do some more you do a little bit that felt good i want to do some more you do a little bit more and the next thing you know came yes. out the door here we go <laughs> yes 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 and that's a that's a balancing act i mean you right. you want to help and you're getting ingrained and you're getting involved um you know but and and, and so in time um uh, you know, sometimes uh, over committing is, is yeah. to the detriment of the nonprofits you're trying to help and serve. You're not uh, being fair to yourself or to them. Being, right. Exactly. You're not, you're not, you know, maybe, um, you know, you're, you're missing meetings or not, not able to maybe have as much impact because you're not in these conversations. And, and so being very thoughtful about, you know, where you join, where you plug yourself in, and uh you know really thinking about okay I'm, I'm really tied to this mission i believe in what they're doing uh and then take that first leap and just join at a committee level there's less yeah. of a commitment than as a board member right. and then and then as you move into a board member position uh understand the expectations of, of, of what it is to be on that board right right well chris thank you so much thanks for your time thanks for joining me thanks for all you do in the nonprofit community here in san antonio you're you're a, a big player and you're very much appreciated 
it's my pleasure, Randy, and thanks for what you do. Uh, I'm very excited for the uh, where BearFest is going. And uh, uh, I can tell you since this time we've met, I've probably mentioned BearFest to many organizations uh, that Excellent. are interested in, in what you're doing. And uh, so again, I just appreciate all you do for our community as well. And thank you for this opportunity to share. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you. God bless you.